uh, and next we have we here here from uh, Vishwatan Saragadam Raja Venkata. Was that all right? <laughs> okay. So uh, we will talk about wavelet three parsing with freeform lensing. And freeform, I remember the first time I saw a freeform optical element. It was inside that size factory in in uh, Jena in Germany. And they said, yeah, we can make these fantastic surfaces, uh, really precise, but nobody knows yet what we are going to do with them. And today we, we have some ideas of what we can do when we make optics that look any, any way at all. And computation, of course, will be crucial here for, for applying them. So HDMI. There's always the question, how many PhDs does it take to, to uh, use the display equipment? So just a, since we have the, ah, here you are. Very good, take it away. We, I'll give you a note when it's five minutes. Yep. So if you want questions, then you better yep. wrap it up. Yep. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think uh, I should also thank uh, Professor Heidrich for uh, doing all the groundwork for me. He has convinced you that diffractive optics are amazing. What I'll do is I'll convince you that it's also great if you want to sense images. Um, so this talk is essentially about uh, combining two ideas in the field of computation photography. The first one is uh, the wavelet transform of images, and the second one is freeform lensing and how it can be used for boosting SNR of measurements for imaging. So I want to start off by saying that the wavelet transform of images has been uh, the cornerstone of a lot of success in Im uh, imaging and compression. Um, and it has found its way into a lot of our uh, everyday applications, like uh, compression of images using the JPEG uh, 2000 algorithm, or rendering of images uh, by reducing the number of uh, computations you need to do, and all the way to compressive sensing, where you use the wavelet uh, transform as some form of a, a regularizer for uh, linear inverse problems. So the success of wavelet transform relies on three key ideas. One is that uh, the transform is sparse, which means that the total number of unknowns are quite small compared to the signal itself. The second one is the decomposition is a multi-scale decomposition. So you have a low resolution snapshot of the image and then the details and so on. The third one, and most important to this talk, is that the coefficients uh, themselves are structured uh, starting from low resolution to high resolution. Uh, what that means is that an edge is probably an edge at low resolution as much as it is at high resolution. Um, so this particular model of uh, structure across uh, scales is called the wavelet zero tree model. Um, and this uh, is based on the fact that uh, Images have a lot of edges, and these edges feature as a dominant wavelet component across the scale, and they follow a particular pattern. The pattern is that uh, if you know that uh, one of the wavelet coefficient is zero at a coarser scale, then it is very highly likely that uh, the coefficients are zero even at a finer scale. So if there is no edge at a low resolution image, probably there is no edge at a high resolution image itself. This is the same uh, you use for JPEG 2000 compression, where you start with uh, decoding the low resolution image, and then you slowly start adding details, depending on uh, how much data you have received so far. So it turns out that you can also use the same idea for uh, adaptively sensing an image, where uh, you can keep measuring the wavelet coefficient one by one, and depending on uh, how much budget you have, you can keep adding details. So this was the idea proposed by Deutsch et al. in uh, 2009. The idea is that using some sensing hardware, you measure a coarse uh, snapshot of the image, and then use this to guide uh, how you should uh, start sampling uh, thereon. So for example, uh, you start with a low resolution version, and then measure all the children. And then you see that uh, one of the child coefficients is uh, uh, very small, which means that it's probably not an edge. So in that case, you wouldn't measure anything at finer scale along that branch. Uh, on the other hand, if it turns out that it's a dominant component like the red one here, you would, you would measure uh, along that branch. So this idea combined with the fact that wavelet uh, transform is sparse means that you need very few measurements and you know what kind of measurements you want to make a priori. So this uh, talk essentially uses the idea of freeform lensing to see how uh, we can practically implement this adaptive sensing. 
So to start off with, I want to uh, emphasize the importance of uh, an adaptive uh, signal model. And then I'll, uh, I'll talk about how uh, freeform lensing comes into the picture and how it uh, betters all the results we get. So the past two or three decades of signal processing has been dominated by uh, what is called a prior for a signal. Essentially, how much more do you know about the signal you're measuring? And in the case of images, there have, uh, there have been several examples. The, the reason you want to have a strong signal prior is that you want to measure as little as possible and then uh, reconstruct the signal. So for images, you have the wavelet sparsity uh, or the sparsity of gradients of images or some of the, the more recent learned uh, representations like overcomplete dictionaries and neural networks. The, the key idea of all of these is to, linear, uh, to regularize the linear inverse problem. And the way it is done is uh, you typically have some signal, in this case image, and then using certain sensing hardware, you make a set of non-adaptive measurements. So to say that uh, you don't know a priori what the signal is, but you have a fixed measurement strategy. And then you uh, collect the measurements, and then using your signal prior, you regularize and invert uh, the signal. So here, uh, uh, gamma of x is the signal prior you're looking at. There are two problems associated with this non-adaptive sensing strategy. The first one is that the recovery process typically is very long. For example, if you have a one megapixel image, uh, this can be 10 to 20 minutes, assuming you have a good computer, and much longer if not. The second one is that uh, the performance of such a strategy degrade as uh, 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 due to noise, and this is a serious problem. Typically, if the uh, number of measure, um, the number of measurements keep reducing, noise uh, plays a, uh, a degrading role in your final reconstruction. So, in the case of image, let's see how exactly you would uh, image this and what kind of problems you face. Uh, the classical approach for uh, measuring an image using some kind of a compressive sensing strategy is to build a single pixel camera where you have a spatial light modulator, such as a DMD, and then you use a photo detector to take the measurement. Uh, you would uh, modulate the scene using some known patterns, for example, permuted Hadamard or random binary patterns. And then by uh, using an L1 minimization approach to get a sparse solution, you would estimate uh, the wavelet transform of the image, for example. From here on, it's a simple uh, inversion of uh, the wavelet transform to get the image. And as you can see, it's, it's typically noisy. So th we could have avoided this uh, issue if, uh, if we knew exactly what wavelet coefficients to measure, then it would be a direct uh, uh, optical way of implementing a wavelet transform. Uh, but the problem is we do not exactly know uh, what, where are the measurement locations for any particular scene. Uh, this is exactly where the wavelet tree model comes into the picture. What it says is you start off with a small set of measurements, and then you choose what exactly you should do from there on. This was the idea that was proposed by Deutsch et al., as I had mentioned previously. So the idea is that instead of multiplexing using uh, permitted Hadamard or random binary patterns, you multiplex with certain wavelet patterns. So you start off non-adaptively by measuring a very core scale representation of the image, and now you have a snapshot, and this will help you guide the measurement procedure itself. So what you do next is you let the measurement process take over, and uh, you let it decide what kind of measurements to make next. So in this case, you can see that uh, most measurement resources are concentrated around edges of the image. And then slowly, you see that the, con uh, the reconstruction is also sharper around the edges. And wherever there is uh, low resolution, not much uh, measurements are made. Um, although this uh, was uh, proposed in the past, the problem is that such a naive implementation does not work well in practice. The, the reason is that uh, as you keep measuring higher and higher frequency components, uh, noise starts dominating your uh, measurements. The reason for this is that when you modulate, you essentially uh, modulate the scene with a wavelet uh, basis, and the wavelet basis tend to become more and more spatially compact. So because uh, the region of interest that's being modulated becomes smaller, the, the noise starts dominating your signal, and this becomes a problem. So you can see that the signal-to-noise ratio rapidly drops under the noise flow. 
So what this translates to is that uh, your reconstruction will be bad, and it gets worse as you keep increasing the number of measurements, which is slightly counterintuitive. So it seems like uh, simply adapting the measurements is not enough, and we need to do something different. And that's where freeform lensing comes into the picture. So what we do is uh, we modulate the scene by projecting certain patterns, but we project those patterns not using a DMD, but uh, a phase modulator. So uh, so the first change we make from whatever Deutsch proposed was we project patterns. Uh, this is still the same hardware, except we use an active light source. And then we use a phase spatial light modulator to modulate it. Uh, the nice thing about phase, mo uh, phase SLM is that they do not attenuate the amplitude at all. So whatever pattern you require, all the light is pumped into exactly that pattern. So if you have a spatially compact pattern, it does not result in loss in uh, signal to noise ratio. Because as you keep making it smaller, all the energy is being directed into this pattern. So for example, here you can see that the pattern is uh, very compact. But then all the light is uh, uh, illuminated only in this region. So you have no loss in energy. Um, so this is what the energy would look like if uh, you were to project these patterns and use a photo detector to measure the energy. What you see is uh, the energy is almost constant uh, for all the scales. So this, this pretty much overcomes this one single bottleneck associated with adaptive imaging and uh, makes it practical. So what we have done is we have combined uh, two ideas here. Uh, we w the, the goal is to adaptively sense uh, an image, and we do this by passing the wavelet transform. Uh, and we combine this with uh, freeform lensing, and we, s uh, we see that concentrating light uh, overcomes the bottleneck of signal-to-noise ratio. And this results in high SNR measurements. Uh, because this is directly measuring the wavelet coefficient, the reconstruction time is you know, next to uh, nil. And um, because the SNR stays constant independent of scale, you, uh, you get progressively better images. Uh, to verify that our model actually works in uh, practice, we built a lab prototype. The, the prototype consists of a green laser um, along with a beam expander, which uh, illuminates a phase uh, spatial light modulator. The phase mod uh, spatial light modulator creates a uh, pattern uh, of choice. And then this pattern is expanded by an objective lens onto, uh, onto the scene. We use a grayscale camera as a photo detector, uh, and then sum, uh, sum the intensity over all the pixels to measure the image. Uh, just as an example, uh, let's say that we have a target pattern here, which is bottom, uh, sorry, top uh, left square. Uh, this is the phase, uh, uh, phase pattern that you would display on the modulator. And the projected pattern looks in the following way. So now if I want to uh, display a different pattern, uh, I would have to change the phase pattern, and then I would achieve this. You can see that the, the light intensity slightly increased from the previous uh, pattern. And finally, if you go more spatially compact, you see that the intensity increases here. But the overall energy uh, contained within this pattern uh, stays the constant. So here are some examples of uh, what we can achieve with this imager. Uh, we have a subject. Uh, uh, this is a snowman consisting of some distinct edges. Uh, what I'm uh, showing here is uh, adaptive sensing uh, in action. You essentially start off by measuring the force wavelet coefficient. And then in the middle, you see where all the wavelet coefficients are being measured. And you observe that uh, around the edges, the coefficients are being measured first. And then you move on to the interior of the cameraman. And once it's almost done, you move on to the exterior. That's exactly how you would want to uh, image uh, a particular scene as well, starting with details. Uh, because of the fact that uh, we are relying on uh, uh, the wavelet transform being sparse, you can see that uh, by the time you have measured a quarter of the measurements, uh, the, the reconstruction quality is quite good. Um, on the left side, you have the raster scanned image, which acts as the ground truth. So uh, at a very high compression rate, you can achieve a very uh, good quality image. So the advantage of uh, using a phase modulator uh, is evident when we compare uh, adaptive imaging uh, if you were to use just a DMD. At low resolution, that's, uh, that is if uh, you were to measure only a quarter of the uh, wavelet coefficient, 
the images kind of look similar. Uh, both are blurred out, and uh, there are no high-frequency artifacts. But as the number of measurements uh, start increasing, you can see that uh, phase modulator uh, uh, quality keeps increasing, but a DMD image has spurious high-frequency content, which is basically because of uh, degrading noise, uh, uh, degrading SNR. Um, here is an example of comparison between uh, adaptive sensing and uh, compressive sensing. We scan a statue of a horse for comparison. Uh, the image uh, dimensions are 64 by 64. So uh, I'll be showing progressively increasing number of measurements. Uh, here is a, uh, an extreme case of compression where you uh, measure only 6% of the com uh, coefficient. You can see that not much is visible in CS, but you can start seeing some uh, uh, some outline of the horse. And as you keep uh, increasing the number of measurements, you can see the horse being resolved better and better with uh, adaptive sensing and in a very noise-free manner. Uh, but CS has uh, noise persisting almost till 50%. Not just that, uh, because we are directly measuring the wavelet coefficients, the proposed method requires, uh, it hardly requires any extra time to construct, whereas uh, CS has that problem. Um, the benefits of uh, wavelet sensing are higher if you have higher resolution. For the same number of uh, measurements, you can see that a uh, 256 by 256 image has uh, higher uh, uh, details. And you can also do things like uh, foveated imaging, where if you know a priori that you are interested in a certain region of interest, then you can ask all the sampling resources to be concentrated within that uh, region. Um, this, uh, this idea comes with some limitations. The first limitation is that uh, the speed of imaging itself is limited by the spatial light modulator. Uh, having a faster modulator would overcome this problem. The second one is associated with uh, the fact that we use an active illumination. So any kind of strong interreflections will cause problems like the lips of frog here. And if the wavelet tree model itself is violated, then you'll see that uh, the, the sensing strategy does not work. So in conclusion, we have proposed an adaptive uh, wavelet tree parsing uh, implementation that is practical using a phase spatial light modulator. And we have seen that this leads to progressive reconstruction with uh, minimal reconstruction loss. Thank you. Thank you. What questions do we have here? Uh, I will come to you. Thank you for the talk. Um, wavelet coefficients are generally generated by an encoding that's positive and negative, right. but this encoding that you've proposed is only positive. How do you handle that? Yeah. Uh, so if I may rephrase the question, how do you uh, handle the fact that you need to measure both the positive and negative parts uh, of wavelet coefficients? So you do this by separating the wavelet basis into positive part, negative part. Uh, measuring the coefficients and subtracting both of them on computer. Yeah. Any other questions? We do have a couple minutes. So um, do you think it's possible to design patterns to simultaneously measure multiple wavelet coefficient um, so that to avoid the noise problem? Uh, so uh, like multiplex the some wavelet basis together uh, to measure some combination of wavelet coefficients. So the question is, can you multiplex the wavelet coefficients further to increase the... Um, so if you were to use something like a phase modulator, uh, it's better to leave them as is, because you would concentrate all the light within the pattern. Uh, but uh, outside that, uh, uh, I am not sure there will be gains uh, just by multiplexing the patterns themselves. So for example, the photon noise will still be an issue even if you multiplex it. Yeah, does, does that answer your question? OK, yeah. OK, is there any final question for the speaker? Uh, we are recording, so. I was curious how you might deal with color because edges in different color channels might be at different locations. So do you have like a different adaptive sampling strategy? So is the question, uh, how do you uh, image uh, color images? Yeah, because edges may be at different wavelengths may be in different spatial locations. Right, yeah. Uh, so a naive way of dealing with it would be to treat 
the three uh, channels separately and think of it as imaging three different images. So in that case, uh, uh, none of them is related. Yeah. So it's a 3x uh, reduction in uh, speed, but yeah, that's the price you pay. Right, any final questions? Thank you so much.